the story of the kings and queens of England is more surprising than you might think. It's a fine drama, a thousand years of tales of lust and betrayal, of heroism and cruelty, of mysteries, murders, tragedies and triumphs. And it's also quite unlike the history of other countries' royalty. The thing about the kings and queens of England is that they're totally different from anywhere else, which probably explains why they're still in business, when almost everywhere else they've either been given the chop or have stopped being regal. This programme looks at England's monarchs from the death of Queen Anne to the accession of Victoria. Well, Britain's monarchs, actually. And if you look at Europe at the start of this story in 1714, you'll see just what I mean. A European king is an absolute ruler. Louis XIV, Peter the Great, Philip V of Spain, Frederick William of Prussia, all men of unlimited power. It's not like that in Britain. Queen Anne has died. There are no Protestant Stuarts left. The Protestant line to the English throne now passes through James's granddaughter, Sophia, who had married a German prince with the title of Elector of Hanover, and then from her to her son, George Lewis, who's inherited that antiquated title. Into one quarter of the royal coat of arms pops the amazingly complicated device of a 54-year-old German princeling. And when he comes to England for his coronation, he knows perfectly well that he's not going to be anything like those other rulers. He will be almost powerless. So it really doesn't matter that he can't speak a word of English. At the opening of Parliament, King George stood in silence while his words were read by the Lord Chamberlain. The crown that had belonged to Normans, French Plantagenets, Welsh Tudors and Scottish Stuarts had now passed to the German Hanoverians. The new king's son, George Augustus, arrived from Herrenhausen to take his seat in the House of Lords as Duke of Rothsey, heir to the throne. Before leaving Germany, he proudly declared, I have not a drop of blood in my veins which is not English. Rothsey, of course, is a Scottish dukedom. George Augustus did share one trait with his father's English subjects, a hearty dislike of King George, and for the same reason. Twenty years before George became King of England, something very mysterious had happened to his wife's best friend, the dashing Count Königsmark. His wife, Princess Sophia Dorothea, had come to detest her husband, who spent his time either engaged in endless European wars or enjoying his various mistresses. Königsmark tried to help her escape from Hanover. He failed. The Count simply disappeared from the face of the earth, and the Princess was banished and imprisoned. Her son, George Augustus, never forgave his father. In fact, father-son detestation would be the defining mark of the Hanoverian dynasty. They thrived on it. But the English weren't too keen on that sort of behavior either. They might have been more sympathetic if they'd approved of the two mistresses that George brought with him. But they called them the Maypole and the Elephant and decided they were simply greedy Germans with their snouts in the trough. And there were Scottish noblemen who thought that with George lacking support in England, this might an opportunity to hand the throne back to the Stuart family, and in particular to James II's son, living in France and known as the Pretender. The French thought this would be a great idea. Louis XIV's mistress, Madame de Maintenon, even presented him with a song to be sung on his accession. It had originally been written for Louis to celebrate his recovery from a surgical procedure on his bottom. She translated it for the man who should, she thought, be James VIII of Scotland, and why not James the Third of England? God save a gracious king, long live a noble king. God save the king. The song turned out to be a bigger hit than the man. The Jacobite Rising of 1715 was a complete flop, and after spending a couple of months wandering around the Highlands, James went home to France. George's throne was safe. He spent every winter in Hanover and left the government of England to his ministers. His own work was done by a new figure, the Prime Minister, a politician acting as a king substitute. The first man to take on this role was Robert Walpole. Since Walpole didn't speak German, the pair of them communicated in schoolboy Latin. King George died a sudden death in 1727 while in Hanover, aged 67. 
His son was living in Richmond, forbidden by the old man to take any part in court life or even to see his own children. When Walpole came with the news of his father's death, George II appears to have regarded it as a wind-up. That is one big lie. But the outcast prince was indeed now George II, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, Elector of Hanover, Duke of Brunswick, Lüneburg and Duke of Celle. When he'd been convinced, he came here to Leicester Square. At the time it was Leicester House, where he'd been running his own court. And here he was attended by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who formally presented most powerful documents in the world. When William the Conqueror and Henry II died, their wills established who would rule after them. George took his father's will and instead of opening it, shoved it in his pocket. It was never seen again, to the great disappointment of his father's mistresses. George II's wife, Queen Caroline, had very firm ideas on what should happen next and her husband was quite obedient. The result was that everyone who'd been hoping for their own promotion in a changed government was disappointed. Walpole remained Prime Minister. He'd promised her that she would get a personal grant of £100,000 a year. Double the offer his opposition came up with, and very little actually changed at all. That included the traditional hostility between anyone called King George and his son. The son in question was now, of course, the son of George II, Prince Frederick. According to Queen Caroline, he was the greatest ass, the greatest liar, the greatest canali, and the greatest beast in the whole world. And we heartily wish he was out of it. She would have said it in German. George agreed with the Queen and refused to allow Frederick to marry Princess Wilhelmina of Prussia on the entirely sensible grounds that I did not think that in crafting my half a coxcomb upon a mad woman would improve the breed. Prince Frederick's view of his father was, by contrast, quite balanced and objective. He's an obstinate, self-indulgent miser de Martinet with an insatiable sexual appetite. Obstinate? Yes. Self-indulgent? A fair point. Miserly. Well, he had slashed Frederick's allowance to make him less of a social rival. Martinet. Well, certainly a man of relentless and determined regular routine. And the sexual appetite? We assume that as is right. For instance, he began seriously lusting after the beautiful young wife of the Count of Volmoden when he met her in Hanover in 1735, and he told the Queen that You must love the Valmoden, for she loves me. The popular view of the king was that he was a randy buffoon. He seems to have been flattered by the jokes about his sexual efforts. As his father had once done, Frederick ran his own alternative court, which was far more popular than the king's. King George II didn't like that. My God, popularity always makes me sick, but this makes me vomit. The pair of them even patronized rival operatic outfits. The king and his entourage went to see Handel at the Haymarket. Handel had written George's coronation anthems. His music was grand and glorious, altogether suitable for magnifying the greatness of a self-important royal personage. The prince and his crowd stayed away. They went instead to the Theatre Royal in Lincoln's Inn Fields. That was where opera was being transformed into popular musical theatre. The biggest hit was The Beggar's Opera, a vigorous tale of the criminal classes which lots of people said was intended as a satire on the court and Walpole's government. When you censure the age, be cautious and sage, lest the courtiers offended should be. If you mention by so bribed, it's so pat to all the tribe, each cries, that was leveled at me. It was all very entertaining, watching royalty playing out their family quarrels, but they were not quite reduced to the level of powerless performers. King George was a fighting man, like his father, head of the army, and very much engaged in the quarrels between the rulers of continental Europe. Walpole tried hard to keep him out of wars, but in 1739, the king got his way, and England went to war with Spain. This was the start of a steadily growing involvement in the power struggle between France, Prussia, and the Habsburg Empire. Its culmination for George came in June 1743. He found himself under attack by the French at a German village called Dettingen. His horse bolted, but George stood in front of his troops, waved his sword, and made a rather ponderous but actually rather brave little speech. Now, boys... Now for the honour of England, 
Farm behaved bravely and the French will soon run. And so he became the last English king to lead his troops in battle. It was a fierce fight and George emerged a bit of a hero. But he didn't rule the country. Governments and ministers came and went not because he wanted them, but because Parliament wanted them. In fact, George called himself a prisoner on the throne. In 1745, he played no part in the battles of Preston Pans or Culloden, which were far more important to the throne than the Battle of Dettingen. After all, they were battles for the throne itself. The cause of King James Stuart, the king who'd fled from William of Orange in 1688, had never been forgotten by the Scottish Highlanders. Its supporters, supporters of a Roman Catholic monarchy, were called Jacobites, the Latin for James being Jacobus. James's son, the pretender, had tried and failed to take the throne in 1715, and now, 30 years on, he was known as the Old Pretender. His son Charles, born in Rome, was the Young Pretender. Bonnie Prince Charlie to his supporters, Charles Casimir was 25 years old, pale, thin, romantic and brave. And he decided that George was so unpopular, it would be a doddle to take over. He turned up at his own expense in the Hebrides, and some of the Scottish clans. Most of them responded, but out of a combination of loyalty and desperation rather than conviction. Enthusiastically welcomed into Edinburgh and roundly defeated the government army at Preston Pans. The news created a passion of patriotism when it reached London. The city might have lampooned the court and sneered at it, but this was different. That evening, the king was visiting the theatre, the King's Theatre, Drury Lane, and the orchestra struck up a tune which they'd just got hold of. The audience loved it. None of them knew that it had been the old pretender's music, or the King of France's. The song had changed sides and became the national anthem. Actually, it became everybody's anthem at one time or another. Frenchmen, Germans, Russians, Swiss, Liechtensteiners, Swedes, Danes and Americans have all swelled with patriotic pride to exactly the same tune. But when God Save the King became London's big hit, it was because no one could see how the King would be saved any other way. Marshal Wade, the best officer in the government army, said that Scotland was lost and England would fall prey to the first comer. Lord grant that Marshal Wade may by thy mighty aid victory bring. May he save Hush, and like a torrent rush, rebellious gods to crush, God save the king. The rebels took Manchester, then Derby. London trembled, but not as much as the clansmen. They'd marched expecting England to rise in their support and the French to invade. Instead, they had no support at all. Most fundamentally, they realized that the English would never accept a Roman Catholic king. They'd outflanked a large English army, but it was now on their tail, and another was coming up from London. So back they went, and the clansmen were finally slaughtered in their thousands at Culloden in April 1746. Charles hid out for months in the Scottish islands, hunted through the mountains by troops and with a price on his head, but protected by tribal loyalties until he finally escaped back to France. And the clan culture of the Highlands was systematically and ruthlessly extirpated. Clans were dispersed, their leaders imprisoned or executed, plaid and weaponry and bagpipes were banned. The would-be Charles III made a bizarre secret return to England in 1750, where he converted to Protestantism and expected this would encourage his supporters to have more hope. They were more impressed by his degree of attachment to the bottle. Not so much the king over... George also found his other great enemy removed. His son, Frederick, died in 1751. He'd been hit hard in the stomach by a tennis ball and the resulting abdominal ulcer burst and killed him. The new heir to the throne was a 12-year-old child, Frederick's son, George. But the great problems of the kingdom were outside the king's grasp. His country was now a great imperial trading power with huge involvements in India, the East Indies, North America and the Mediterranean. So was France. 
At the same time, continental Europe was constantly boiling over into war, and Hanover was in the middle of that. In 1756, the great powers finally locked horns in a do-or-die struggle that would girdle the whole world. This would become the Seven Years' War. It was truly the First World War. Britain fought in the name of its king. But that king now neither directed policy nor took part in the battles. A new world. In fact, affairs were so far out of the king's control that when he dismissed ministers he didn't like, they came right back again. So far as the English were concerned, this was just how things ought to be. Englishmen were entitled to liberty. The despots were on the other side, Catholic France and Austria. Their whole life, commerce, industry and fighting force was directed royal tyrants who ruled over starving and powerless peasants. And on the other side, Protestant Britain, whose commerce was run by men of business, whose industry was directed by free tradesmen, whose army and navy were run by heroes and manned by proud free men, and whose court was the centre of society, not of autocratic power. And that was how many of the British really did see it. Of course, they were also fighting with despotic Prussia, but that was a minor detail. The general perception was that this was a war of free Britons against European despots. Poor George died at the height of the war in 1760, and it didn't matter at all. His grandson, now George III, was 22 years old. He had been brought up by his mother, a German princess in her imitation of the very deferential court of Hanover. He learned the European idea of what a king should be, an enlightened despot whose power was absolute and was to be used for the benefit of mankind. This was, of course, very far from the English notion of kingship, in which the king was the leading figure in society, but whose power was entirely controlled by Parliament. He immediately set to work as a bossy, quick-speaking he read widely, he was fascinated by machinery and agriculture, he was a man delighted by the agricultural and industrial revolutions, and he was determined to restore the crown to what he saw as its proper position, a position abandoned, in his view, by Georges I and II. Unlike them, he'd been born in England, and spoke good English even if his grasp of grammar was ropey, and he had no old or young pretender to challenge him. At the opening of his first parliament, he declared, born and educated in country. I glory in the name of Britain. Parliament was controlled by one party, the Whigs, effectively an oligarchy of rich men who ran the country by a system of bribery, patronage and nepotism. George felt that it was his job to improve matters. And so began the most catastrophic reign since James II. If it hadn't been for George III's attempt to turn back the clock, the inhabitants of New York might still be using British passports and the inhabitants of Los Angeles and Miami, Spanish ones. Now there's a thought. To break the power of the Whigs, he set about creating what was almost his own political party, a group of MPs known as the King's Friends. He took back the power of distributing positions and favours from the government and did it himself, so he soon built up a collection of political dependents. His first objective was to bring an end to the war. He didn't at all share the anti-French views of the Prime Minister William Pitt. It took a lot of political manipulation, but in 1763, with Pitt removed from power, a peace treaty was signed. By this stage, the war had actually been won. Pitt's policies had resulted in Britain becoming the dominant colonial power in the world. Britain was more or less undisputed ruler of North America, India, the Caribbean, and much besides. And George took the credit, the glory, and tried to take control. At the end of the Seven Years' War, in 1763, the King of England ruled over more of the world than any man since Genghis Khan, an empire about five times larger than Rome. Of course, he wasn't in the position of an Asiatic tyrant, or even your common or garden European despot. His control would have to be through Parliament. His power was limited to choosing ministers, and even that wouldn't work if Parliament and the country wouldn't stomach them, as George kept finding out. His solution was to do all he could to increase his own influence in Parliament, in effect get stuck right into political intrigues. Since it was illegal to report parliamentary debates, people became very suspicious of what was going on. 
He spent huge sums on trying to influence elections and would even personally go out canvassing. On one occasion, for instance, bustling into a draper's shop, saying, the Queen wants a gown, wants a gown, announcing who to vote for and rushing out again. Personally, when things went wrong. When Parliament rejected a bill that would have helped the Spitalfields weavers, the weavers marched off to find the King at Wimbledon. Shades of the Peasants' Revolt. George listened to their complaints and persuaded them to go back home. But when they realised he wasn't going to help, they rioted and he personally ordered out the troops. He said he would put himself at the head of the army or do anything else to save his country. He also had a hand in creating the notorious Stamp Act of 1765, which tried to make the English colonists in America pay a tax on paper. This was the moment at which the whole language of politics began to change. One Virginia colonist declared, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I his Cromwell. May George III profit from their example. The Cromwellian revolution of the previous century had certainly been driven by the connection between taxation and liberty. The issue now was that the 13 English colonies in America had their own governments, run by their own local oligarchies, and raising their own taxes. The idea that they could be taxed by the oligarchy in London, headed by the king, was totally outrageous. They would have no way to influence what was done or what they had to pay. Colonists who supported the government were threatened by their compatriots. Some were tarred and feathered. And by the time the act came into effect, there wasn't a single person who'd accepted the job of commissioner to collect the tax. It had to be repealed. There was similar alarm in England, as in his attempt to control Parliament, George arrested his leading critic there, John Wilkes. Mobs rioted in the name of Wilkes and Liberty and threatened the king. Wilkes was released and it was established that there was a legal right to report and criticise what happened in Parliament. But by 1770, he had created the political system he wanted. The political parties had collapsed, and he had a docile chief minister, Lord North, with a parliamentary majority through whom he could run things the way he thought they should be. George liked running things. Popularly known as Farmer George, he took a very close interest in modern farming methods, developing animal breeds and new crops. These were the same modern farming methods which by enclosing common lands and creating large self-contained farms were breaking up village communities all over England and creating a new class of half-starved landless wage labourers. Bad harvest didn't help, nor did a collapse in trade. The colonists in America were showing their anger by refusing to import anything from Britain. Lord North decided the best thing to do was repeal all the taxes on them except for a symbolic tax on tea. Three years later, he arranged another act of Parliament to try to help the East India Company sell more tea in America, and radicals in Boston retaliated with a symbolic tea party at which men dressed as Native Americans. The reaction in England, stirred by the popular press, was that the colonists must be punished. George certainly shared that view. Blows must decide whether they are to be subject to this country or independent. Misunderstanding the strength of feeling and of organisation against them, the government tried to use too little force and triggered a full-scale rebellion. The rebel colonists proclaimed their independence in 1776, and with the backing of a large part of popular opinion in England, George was determined to fight them and crush them. The result, as many less warlike Englishmen had been warning, was disaster for England. Even Lord North wanted out, but George was in charge. The American Revolutionary War became a campaign not against unjust government or English rule, but against the very principle of monarchic government. George's determination to be active in government and place himself at the heart of politics created a new republican movement, a language in which to attack the rule of kings. The Peace of Versailles in 1783 forced Britain to recognise the United States of America. Six years later, a host at Versailles, Louis XVI of France, was himself called on by a revolutionary crowd who carried him off and set up their own republic. The process of destroying monarchy was underway. Did George understand what he'd done? He certainly fretted about the American disaster, and perhaps it was his own sense of failure that made him display signs of mental disturbance in 1788, talking incessantly and behaving oddly thought making him bleed would help. When that failed, the Prince of Wales took over the treatment. 
The Prince of Wales was 26 years old, a dashing if rather fat man about town, and in the grand tradition of their Hanoverian ancestors, King George and his son hated each other. The Prince lived in the house bought for his mother, the Duke of Buckingham's magnificent home near St James's Park. It was still called Buckingham House. He liked it so much he eventually built a rather dull palace for it. When he came of age, he'd set up his home in Clarence House, taken his seat in the House of Lords, and set about being a thorn in Daddy's flesh, partly by opposing his father's ministers and partly by his wildly extravagant social life, in the course of which he secretly married a glamorous widow, Mrs Fitzherbert, after a passionate wooing process that included theatrically stabbing himself to safely produce as much blood as possible. The marriage was illegal. He wasn't allowed to wed without the king's consent. It was also significant that the lady was a Roman Catholic. In 1780, anti-Catholic rioters stirred up by Lord George Gordon had taken over London for a week. Eventually dispersed by troops on the king's orders, the Gordon riot Lord George. Prinny, as his friends called him, spent his time in gambling clubs, in the company of dandies like Beau Brummel, and put much energy into building the bizarre and spectacular pavilion in Brighton. That's where he was when he heard that the king was mentally ill, and he hurried off to Windsor to take over. 28 years old, he was going to be regent. When the king saw his son, he physically attacked him. He threw Prinny against a wall. The poor boy burst into tears. There was then a huge political battle over what powers the regent would be allowed to have. His own bunch of politicians led by Fox on one side and the king's led by Pitt on the other. Fox's supporters saw Pitt as a sort of fungus with as many arms as an octopus growing on and taking over the royal dunghill. And the Prince of Wales brought in his own physician to treat the king or torture him. The royal physicians blistered the king's forehead to draw the poison out of his brain forced him to take useless drugs, ordering servants to sit on the king when he resisted, and refused to let him have a fire in his room during the terribly cold winter. All this when the country was anticipating French invasion and radical revolution, and volunteer regiments were being formed as a desperate line of defense. Very desperate. Finally, new physicians were brought in who gave the king gentler treatment, and he recovered. In 1801, before the arguments over how the regency would function had been resolved, the king was back in charge, but not in the way he had been. The American defeat had been a personal disaster for him and dramatically weakened his political position. In an effort to reassert it, he'd installed a 24-year-old as Prime Minister and Chancellor of the Exchequer, thinking that here at least was a politician he could control. But William Pitt's son, Pitt the Younger, was shrewd, capable and fully understood that George depended on him, so he held all the cards. And it was Pitt who had to decide how to deal with the spread of revolutionary Republican ideas from America and France into England. The same ideas that had been voiced in America about no taxation without representation were being heard in England, where huge new manufacturing towns had grown up, which had no member of parliament. Three years after the French Revolution, political reform societies called corresponding societies were founded in England. Riots were breaking out in the Midlands, in East Anglia, in Scotland. Attempts were made to kill the king. He was booed and stoned in London. And the French legislature passed a fraternal decree offering aid to all peoples seeking to throw off the chains of tyranny. Once war began with revolutionary France, political radicalism was plainly treason, wasn't it? The government decided on a policy of definitely without trial. The government charged people with treason for organizing public meetings calling for political reform. When they were acquitted, acts were passed which extended the definition of treason to include speaking or writing or bringing the king or his government into contempt. To back it up, a system of internal spying and agent provocateur was instituted. Postmasters were given the job of reporting to the Home Office anything suspicious that they heard or that went through the mail. Public meetings needed special licenses. When William Blake, the artist, found a soldier in his garden, he drove him out, shouting, Damn the king and damn all his soldiers, they're all his slaves. Bad idea. He was put on trial for sedition. The king himself was actually quite popular. He was generally seen as a kind-hearted, slightly bufferish sort of a person. But he was still ultimately in charge of what was going on, 
And when even Pitt insisted that Catholics would have to be allowed the same rights as Protestants and permitted to stand for Parliament, George forced him to resign. The issue had come to the fore because of Ireland. If England had some potential revolutionaries, how many more had Ireland, a land where an oppressed Catholic majority were ruled by imported Protestant colonists and an ideal staging post for a French invasion? In 1801, Ireland was incorporated into Great Britain, creating the United Kingdom. It was an attempt to make Ireland more secure. The fact that at the same time the king formally abdicated his meaningless title of King of France shows exactly where the threat was coming from. But if Ireland was to be truly united with England, there would have to be Catholic emancipation. And King George wouldn't have it. Whatever might have happened could not have been worse than what did. Ireland still bleeds now. The shadow of George III lies over the history of the world more darkly than most people realize. As with the American disaster, it seems as though one part of his mind was determined to make him feel the full weight of his responsibility, and once more, his mental state degenerated. He made a slow recovery, enough to sack his ministers in 1805 when they tried to lift the restrictions on Catholics becoming military officers, but he was becoming blind and infirm, and in 1810 his mind finally collapsed. No one's quite sure what was wrong with him, but a strain of hereditary insanity had run through the royal family ever since Henry V's marriage to Catherine de Valois. Blind and deaf, suffering from abdominal pains and dementia, his body lived on, but his reign was over. Prinny took over at last. The European monarchy had been transformed. The enlightened despots had fallen. Napoleon's empire had swallowed them up, replacing them with dictators from his own family or under his control. Even Hanover had been overwhelmed. The Tsar still survived, but Napoleon was about to invade Russia. Britain stood virtually alone. And in Britain, the ancient principle of the royal prerogative was now in the fat, clammy hands of a gambling, massively indebted, roly-poly dandy with a passion for show and splendor. But the military genius of Wellington and Nelson didn't need a king to guide it, so under his uninspiring, even ridiculous leadership, Napoleon was defeated and the decrowned heads of Europe were brushed down and put back on their thrones. Why, the ruler of the United Kingdom even became King of Hanover. Prinny had been against everything his father stood for. But now he was in power, he suddenly adopted all his father's political principles, especially his determined opposition to letting Catholics have civil rights and to any reform of Parliament. Elections were basically a farce, with some MPs representing constituencies with almost no voters and the vast majority of people unrepresented. The king thought this was fine. Lots of other people didn't. And this became a desperate issue in the years after the Napoleonic War. There were thousands of unemployed ex-soldiers. There was an agricultural depression made worse by the terrible summer of 1816. And there was increasing unemployment due to the use of new machinery. And the Prince of Wales's appetite for luxurious silverware and furniture grew mountainous. Graffiti appeared saying death or the regent's head. At the end of 1816, there was a full-scale riot in London aimed at setting up a radical government. The next month, the Prince Regent's carriage was mobbed on his way to open Parliament. The grim apparatus of repression was revived. The death penalty was restored for unlicensed public meetings. Printers of seditious material were to be seized. There was plenty of seditious material. The Prince Regent was a laughingstock. The flood of caricatures and satires was unstoppable extravagance was spectacular. A few years earlier, the government had agreed to clear his huge debts on condition that he made a legal marriage. The victim selected was his cousin Caroline of Brunswick, a charming, friendly and unassuming young lady who was also a bit of an exhibitionist. He spent the wedding night drunk. After nine months to the day, Caroline gave birth to a daughter, but by then her husband had long abandoned her. He devoted himself to the pursuit of motherly mistresses and treated Caroline with a and the Brighton Pavilion made that declaration loud and clear. 
George III finally died in 1820, having notionally reigned for 60 years, the longest reign until Victoria. And he was 81, the longest life of any British ruler so far. Prinny was now king. His wife, Caroline, now decided to come to England from her exile on the continent and take her place at her husband's coronation. An immediate attempt was made to pass an act of parliament divorcing the royal couple, but it was dangerously unpopular and had to be abandoned. She turned up for the coronation at Westminster Abbey, but the door was closed in her face. The coronation, fabulously expensive, was performed in complete privacy. She went away broken-hearted and died less than three weeks later. Her body was to be returned to Brunswick for burial. The king, nervous of a riot, insisted that the coffin should not be transported through the city of London, but it was seized by Londoners who staged their own funeral procession with it and were gunned down by the house guards at Hyde Park Corner. Afraid of being attacked and afraid of being laughed at because of his great swollen body, from 1823, King George IV avoided being seen in public. He even built a tunnel to allow him to get from his rooms in Brighton Pavilion to the riding school in private. And of course it was said ever since that it connected to his mistress's house. It became essential for the government to break the king's opposition to reform, especially with regard to Catholics, but he held the power of veto. The arguments went on hour after hour, day after day, with the king becoming more enraged and more ill, until finally he broke. By February of 1830, he was partially blind and raving, convinced that he'd commanded a division at Waterloo and ridden a winning race at Goodwood. And so he died and they found 50 years of coats, boots and pantaloons and countless bundles of women's love letters, of women's gloves, of locks of his many mistresses' hair. Why on earth did Britain need a king? What use was he to man or beast? Why in heaven's name wasn't there a revolution? The truth is, no one knows. Some historians think it was a result of Methodism becoming popular, diverting poorer people's energy from politics into religion. Some think it was patriotism in the age of empire, that king and country was a slogan that helped people pull together against Napoleon. But perhaps, given the riots, rebellions and mutinies, it was due more to the efficiency of the police state and the forcefulness of repression. And lurking at the back of people's minds was the distant memories echoed and made more terrible by the vision of the guillotine in France. Always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. Despite George's enthusiastic sexual enterprise, he had only produced one legitimate child, and she died in childbirth. The heir to the throne was his brother, William, who was 54. He had been sent into the Navy as a young man, where he developed into a severe disciplinarian and a stickler for etiquette. After he left, he took an actress, Mrs. Jordan, as his mistress, had lots of illegitimate children, and was given to making tactless speeches with not much intelligence. He eventually had made a royal marriage to another German Protestant princess, and Mr. King and Mrs. Queen lived at Bushy to the north of London, like a quite ordinary couple insisted that his coronation should only cost a tenth of his brothers and he was known to give people a lift in his carriage. All this made him rather popular, but when it came to parliamentary reform, he turned out to be as resistant as any other Hanoverian king. By now the popular pressure for changing the voting system into something more representative was virtually irresistible, giving more men the vote, having MPs for the new towns and secret ballots. This would give the Commons more power, so the House of Lords was resisting it, and William sided with them. By 1832 there seemed a real possibility of civil war or revolution. It's possible that if the royal family were part of the aristocracy, as in every other country with a king, that would have happened. But the king and queen had their family roots in Germany and there was no natural alliance between them and the great aristocratic families. William was weak and was forcefully persuaded to give way and Britain was starved on the road to democracy. <laughs>
After the Reform Bill of 1832, with no more rotten boroughs and greatly reduced scope for electoral corruption, it was no longer possible for the king to play politics inside Parliament to the same extent. The monarchy would now be forced back into its constitutional box, and it was no longer sufficiently dangerous to be worth the trouble of a revolution. When he died in 1837, William's legitimate children were already dead. The heir to the throne was the daughter of his brother Edward, a young girl of 18. She would make a demure and pretty little queen who could leave the business of running England to the professionals. Couldn't she? Sky Digital Viewers Press Red. On UK TV History Next, the modern kings and queens of England coming up here on History and starting on documentary, The Best of British. Blue Planet. George took his father's will and instead of opening it, shoved it in his pocket. It was never seen again, to the great disappointment of his father's mistresses. George II's wife, Queen Caroline, had very firm ideas on what should happen next and her husband was quite obedient. The result was that everyone who'd been hoping for their own promotion in a changed government was disappointed. Walpole remained Prime Minister. He'd promised her that she would get a personal grant of £100,000 a year, double the offer his opposition came up with, and very little actually changed at all. That included the traditional hostility between anyone called King George and his son. The son in question was now, of course, the son of George II, Prince Frederick. According to Queen Caroline, he was the greatest ass, the greatest liar, the greatest canali, and the greatest beast in the whole world. And we heartily wish he was out of it. She would have said it in German. George agreed with the Queen and refused to allow Frederick to marry Princess Wilhelmina of Prussia on the